It was a rough first go around in the big leagues for Colton Kowser, but he's getting a second chance as the Orioles have reportedly recalled him to the big leagues as rosters expanded. But as they did, we didn't see Tyler Wells or John Means get recalled as the pitcher. Could they be back soon? That and more coming up on this episode of the Locked On Orioles podcast. You are Locked On Orioles, your daily Baltimore Orioles podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hey there, Orioles fans. Today is Friday, September 1st, 2023, and welcome back in to the Locked On Orioles podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. As always, I'm your host, Connor Newcomb. And coming up on today's episode, we are going to talk about the Orioles roster moves that they reportedly made on Thursday. With rosters expanding today, it was reported that Colton Kowser and Joey Crable were the two players recalled as rosters expanded from 26 to 28. Break down why those two guys now were the moves, but why those are not necessarily the permanent moves for the rest of September for this Orioles roster. We'll talk a little bit about why it wasn't a guy like John Means and how he did in another pretty fantastic rehab start in AAA on Thursday night. Then we'll hand out some Orioles August awards, highlighting some great performances in the month from Grayson Rodriguez, Ryan Mountcastle, and others. And finally, at the end of the pod, previewing this upcoming weekend series, the big one, Orioles and D-backs in the desert. But that's all coming up on this episode of the Locked on Orioles podcast, which is brought to you by FanDuel Sportsbook. Make every moment more. Right now, new customers can bet $5 and get $200 in bonus bets, guaranteed. So visit FanDuel.com slash locked on to get started today. So we will start today with uh, little Orioles roster news coming out on Thursday. Now today, September 1st, is the day when teams officially can expand their rosters from the usual 26 players to 28 players on the active rosters through the month of September. Now, the old rule used to be you could go from 25 to 40, and you could call up the entire 40-man roster if you wanted to in September. That was archaic. Uh, I think the 28 is nice. I could see them maybe going to 30 at some point, but I think the 28 is nice. You get a little extra at the end of the year, but you're not completely changing the way the game is played in the most important month of the season. But I made my predictions over the last couple of weeks on the pod, and I would settled on Colton Kowser and Brian Baker being the two call-ups. Now, you still can't have more than 14 pitchers on the 28-player roster, so the Orioles had 13 and 13. They could have called up one hitter, one pitcher. That's what they did, and I was half right. And I feel like in vibes sense, I was kind of fully right. Colton Kowser was the hitter. Instead of Brian Baker, it was another right-hander who has been in the bigs before and had some success, some failures. It's Joey Crable instead. I was kind of on the right track with what the Orioles would do with these roster moves. So let's start with Colton Kowser. Of course, it didn't go super well for Kowser his first time around in the big leagues. He was first called up and he had 77 plate appearances, hit just 115 with a 286 on base and a 148 slugging, had two doubles, no homers. And although he walked 17% of the time, which was really elite for a rookie first coming into the bigs, had a 29% strikeout rate, just a 38 WRC plus in his 77 plate appearances in the big leagues. And he got sent down, was demoted on August, August 14th because, you know, the Orioles, they, they were getting Aaron Hicks back and they just, it, it was a tough spot they were in. I mean, Kowser was not producing. They needed wins and they had to make the call to kind of give him a reset. Well, in total this year in AAA, over 300 plate appearances, Kowser has a 143 WRC plus. He's been amazing. Now, in the 13 games since the demotion to AAA, he's played every game, 58 plate appearances, 245 average, 351 on base, 469 slug, been striking out a lot, 35%, been just barely above average, basically a 103 WRC plus hitter. Now, that's a very small sample size, less than 60 plate appearances, still better than what he did in the big leagues. But I had said all along when he got optioned, I said, this pretty much sets up for him to just come back September 1st when the roster's expanded. That's exactly what they did now. The next question is kind of what will his role be with the Orioles now that he's back? How will it differ from last time? Well, it's hard to answer that question right now because we still don't have a good picture of what the Orioles outfield will look like even this time next week. And the reason I say that is you've got a guy in Aaron Hicks who 
is going to be back soon. I mean, all reports say that he may not even need a rehab assignment. He's hitting high velocity. He's running. His back feels good. He says he wants to be activated at some point early next week when the Orioles go to Anaheim to take on the Angels in a Monday through Wednesday series. He wants to be activated at some point in that series. So Hicks is less than a week away, it seems like, of being back to the Orioles. And Aaron Hicks, if you want to keep him, he does not have options. So he's got to stay on the big league roster, which means somebody's got to go down. Now, the two easiest culprits there are Ryan McKenna or Colton Kowser because they're both outfielders. They both play center and they both have minor league options. So you can easily send them back down to AAA. So until we get the Hicks corresponding move, I can't make this like total assumption of what Kowser's role will be. But at least for now, if you're looking at him on a roster with Hicks out, and even if, you know, he stays and maybe McKenna goes back to AAA, you're seeing him, you know, he's not going to play against lefties. He's not going to play against every righty. He's certainly not going to play every day. But he gives the Orioles a chance to get Anthony Santander and Austin Hayes off their feet at times, give Cedric Mullins some breaks because he has not been good recently. I mean, Cedric hit 180 basically in the month of August and has struggled with multiple injuries this year. Hayes is banged up again, and the Orioles don't want Santander out there in the outfield a whole lot. They want to keep him healthy because he's been banged up. So you have a lot of guys you want to spell in the outfield. That's kind of the overarching reason why the Orioles went with an outfielder instead of maybe going with a guy like Joey Ortiz as the September call-up. I, I feel like they wanted an outfielder. And then if you compare it to the other possibility, which really felt like potentially Heston Kerstad, Kowser just gives you much more defensive versatility. Yes, Kerstad can play first and the corner outfields, but Kowser, although he's better in the corners than in center, he can play all three outfield positions, including center field, and he is a plus defender in the corners, either left or right, which really gives you more options than Kerstad, who you'd really rather play at first and then maybe right field at Camden Yards, but definitely not left or center. It just squeezes you a little bit right there. So Kowser gives you more options when he is on the roster, especially if you've got all these outfielders who you're dealing with things. And listen, even if Hicks comes back, replaces McKenna, and Kowser stays, you think about the outfield. Hayes, Mullins, Santander, Hicks, all been banged up this year. And you're a little scared to play them all every single day because you want to keep them healthy in September. That's where Kowser comes in. He can jump in at any of these points, play any of those positions, and give those guys a break when they need it. And you just, I mean, I get that he wasn't great, but I personally trust him more at the plate, vastly more than Ryan McKenna. So if that's what it comes down to. I give Kowser that role instead and just plop those guys in or plop Kowser in for those guys whenever you can to keep them healthy. I think that's going to be his role throughout September for this team. Now, does he make the playoff roster? That's a different story. That depends on how he performs in those spots. But I think that is his role for now and kind of why it wasn't Ortiz or Kerstad at this point. Now, over to the pitcher side, which was obviously the less exciting name of the two, at least Colton Kowser, you know, is a top three prospect in your system and a guy who you think is the future of this team. Wouldn't necessarily throw Joey Crable into that category. And I saw a lot more vitriol about the Crable thing. Listen, the reason why I continue to say I thought it was going to be Brian Baker getting recalled is because once DL Hall already came up last week, I really didn't see this exact September 1st date being a spot where the Orioles felt like it was time to kind of add another name, you know, whether it was getting Tyler Wells back or adding John Means to the roster. Just the date didn't really match up. And that's really the reason why Joey Crable is here. He's going to be available Friday. You know, he's not going to pitch tonight. He threw inning and two thirds and two appearances with the Orioles, his only other stint with the team this year, and retired all five batters that he faced with a couple of strikeouts. So there's that. I mean, that's nice. I would have rather seen Baker. I trust him more, and Baker's been really good lately since going back down to AAA, but I get the Crable thing as well. Similar to Austin Voth coming back from his injury a couple of weeks ago, Crable's not long for the bullpen. Again, you know, this two guys, Crable and Kowser, it was first reported by Rakabako of Masson. It hasn't been confirmed yet by the Orioles. They haven't put out the release. You can't until September 1st. I'm recording here on Thursday night, August 31st, but every beat reporter pretty much said, yes, sources can confirm. And Rock wrote about this. Andy Koska wrote about this as well in the Baltimore banner. He said, sources also said, listen, this is going to be a fluid roster, especially at the end of the bullpen throughout September. These two guys aren't just like sticking there in those spots. And that's the most important thing to see here. Crable's getting called up because they had an extra roster spot and they wanted an extra arm for a couple of days in Joey Crable. He's not like the end-all, be-all Crable's going to be here for the rest of the season. That's certainly not happening. 
Because if you're looking to get Tyler Wells and John Means back here, you have two pretty easy moves to make in Joey Crable and Austin Voth to clear space on the roster right now. The reason the timing didn't work out for Wells or Means is A, for Wells, I just don't think he's quite ready yet. You know, he's pitched out of the bullpen a couple of times in Norfolk, but he's not really getting swings and misses. The velocity really isn't where you'd like it to be for him as a reliever. I think they'd like to get him two, three, four, maybe more appearances in the AAA bullpen and build him up a little more and then get him back. And for John Means, whether they're going to bring him back as a starter or a reliever, I don't think they've decided yet. But either way, he was not built all the way back up yet. And he was scheduled and made a AAA rehab start on Thursday. You are not adding a guy to the roster who threw 80 plus pitches Thursday night and adding him Friday. You're just burning a roster spot for four days if you do that. So that was kind of the clear reason why it was not John Means. Now, in terms of Means and, you know, Joey Crable on the flip side, 275 ERA and 36 innings in AAA, 587 FIP. He's not really striking guys out. Although since he went back down to AAA August 11th, Six innings, one earned run, so he'd been better in Norfolk since he went back down, so that's good. And, you know, he's good for the O's at times, certainly in 2022. But in terms of John Means, after watching, you know, no O's game Thursday night, I watched a lot of his AAA start. I actually feel a little better about him right now, coming back kind of soon. That could have been his final rehab start on Thursday night. Like, he looks pretty close to ready. Now, Means was great against the Worcester Red Sox, the AAA team, for the Boston Red Sox, and Means went five scoreless, six strikeouts, two walks, just one hit, 86 pitches, went from 72 pitches his last start to 86. Big one was one hard hit ball against Means. It was a 103 mile per hour line out from Christian Arroyo, who's a you know been a, a major league regular for the Red Sox for a while, no like triple A journeyman slouch, like an actual big league player. That was the only ball hit over 95 miles per hour. Once again, he induced a lot of soft contact in that rehab start Thursday night. 13 whiffs on 44 swings. He was mostly fastball change-up, 38 fastballs, 31 change-ups, and then nine sliders and eight curveballs. When he threw that curveball, it was good. He got a couple of really good-looking whiffs on that pitch. Had six whiffs on the change-up. That thing looked like its usual, like, fall off the table against right-handers pitch. The one thing that makes me feel like he's not quite back yet is the fastball. He had a little bit of an issue with fastball command and the velocity is still not there. He maxed out at 93, but he averaged 91 and he threw a couple fastballs that were down at 89. Even he just that velocity where you'd like him to be kind of sitting 92 to 94. He's more 91, 92 with the fastball velocity in these recent rehab starts. That doesn't mean he won't continue to build it up, But that's a little worrisome for John Means. Now, we've seen Means still be effective at 91, right? Remember when he ramped up that velocity back in 2020 to like 95, 96? He actually became a worse pitcher. And then he pulled it back to 92, 93 the next year and became much better and threw a no-hitter. So we know that the velocity isn't the end-all, be-all for Means. But in terms of just the rehab part of this, not even getting to the will he be good in the big leagues for the O's this year, in terms of just the rehab part of it, You would like to see him at the very least get the velo back to where it was before the injury. And maybe it won't happen. And maybe he'll still be effective without it because he's been effective without the high velo plenty of times in his career. It's still a pitcher coming off Tommy John, who hasn't pitched in a big league game since April of 2022. And I know he was good, but you just don't know coming off his first TJ. You, You truly just do not know. Now, do I think the off-speed stuff looked good? Yes, I did. Watched a lot of that start, the change-up, the slider, the curveball. I liked what I saw. I think they can play in the big leagues right now. Would they give him a start? Would they make him a piggyback guy, put him in the bullpen? I am unsure right now. But I wouldn't be surprised if once he's fully rested from this start Thursday night, he's potentially back in the big leagues next week. Because the Orioles have until September 8th. That's next Friday to make a decision on him. His rehab assignment would end next Friday. Okay, that is 30 days. Now, that gives them time to make one more rehab start if they wanted to. They could do some sort of kind of shortened start to make sure he throws a few more innings. But I wouldn't be surprised if sometime mid-next week, we see John Means back with the Orioles and you know could replace Austin Voth. You could have Tyler Wells come back. You still got Brian Baker, Mike Bauman still sitting down there in AAA. Joey Crable's not the end-all, be-all. They got other options coming in terms of pitching in Norfolk. But that's a look at what the O's did with the roster moves here on the expansion day of September 1st. 
But we are into September, right? Final month of the regular season. Orioles entering September in first place. What a ride it has been. I want to look back, though, on the month of August because it was another amazing month for the Orioles. They kept their lead in the division. They won a lot of series, played a lot of great games, and had a lot of great performances. Going to hand out some Orioles August awards coming up after this. But first, this episode of the Locked On Orioles podcast is brought to you by FanDuel. Get ready for the NFL season with incredible offers from FanDuel, America's number one sports book. And right now at FanDuel, if you are a new customer, you can bet $5 and get $200 in bonus bets guaranteed. Plus, all customers who bet $5 will get $100 off NFL Sunday ticket from YouTube and YouTube TV. Now is the best time to join FanDuel. The app is easy to use, and you can be on everything from spreads to player props and more. So visit FanDuel.com slash locked on and kick off the NFL season with an offer you won't want to miss. FanDuel, official partner of the NFL. So the Orioles kicked off September, it seems, reportedly by calling up Colton Kowser and Joey Crable as rosters expanded to 28, but didn't want to move into September 1st without recapping the month of August. Of course, the Orioles had the day off Thursday on the final day of August after winning a series two out of three against the Chicago White Sox at home. They're going to embark on a long road trip here coming up soon, with much of it being on the West Coast to start September. But first, let's look back at August. This Orioles team that went 18 and 9 in the month of August, tied for their best record in any month. They were also 18 and nine in April. Now we generally say 19 and nine because they played one game in March on opening day, one in Boston. So you really combine March and April for most stats things. I guess they were 19 and nine, but if you're saying just calendar month, 18 and nine in August ties with April. The Orioles were good again in this month. Now the schedule did certainly soften down the stretch, but the O's still played some good teams and held their own and continued to sit in first place in the month of August. So let's give out some August awards for the Orioles. Let's start with MVP. I talked about him a good amount on yesterday's episode, kind of preluded to the fact that he might win this award, and he did. It's Ryan Mountcastle, who was just outstanding this month for the Orioles. Looks like a different player since he came back from the Vertigo issue. In 117 plate appearances in the month of August, Mountcastle hit 360, with a 444 on base and a 540 slugging. That's a 174 WRC plus best on the team. Here's the stats that I really love from Mountcastle. His 12.8% walk rate this month was the highest walk rate of any month in his career. That is huge for Mountcastle. And while a 21% strikeout rate wasn't anything crazy, it's much lower than we've seen recently from Mountcastle. He had five homers in the month. 360 average was the highest average of any month in his career. The walk rate, highest of any month in his career, and he had the most hits of any month of his career. He kind of did it differently, right? Like he didn't hit for as much power. He didn't hit the ball nearly as hard, didn't drive the ball, didn't barrel it as much as he used to. But it kind of flipped over to his stats getting better, and the approach was better, and he walked more. And if you combine those two things, if he can walk and hit the ball as hard as he has at times, I mean, you got an all-star player right there. And hopefully, that's the player we see in September. Now, switching over to the pitching side, the Orioles Cy Young Award for August. I feel like this guy has won this award a lot of times this year, and he deserves it. I mean, is he in the actual Cy Young conversation right now? Maybe. It's Kyle Bradish, who had five more incredible starts in the month of August for the Orioles. In his five starts, 29 and two-thirds innings, he had a 2.12 ERA with an elite 30% strikeout rate to an 8% walk rate, which is actually lower than league average in the month as well. He was just ridiculous, carving up opposing hitters this month. And there were some good pitchers for the O's in August as well. I mean, Dean Kramer's not even going to get a shout-out when he had a 2-5 ERA in August, but Bradish was just so, so good. Best reliever this month? Not sure Felix Bautista would have won it anyway. Of course, the saddest moment of August was Bautista going down with the injury to the UCL on Friday night, but the best reliever? He kind of made his return. Yenier Cano, 12 scoreless innings for Cano in the month of August. He allowed just seven hits. Only one of them was a double and an extra base hit. 12 strikeouts to just one walk and one hit batter. Got that ground ball rate back up to 50%. The changeup looked really good again. The sinker was dive bombing. It was really good stuff from Cano. 
not still not back to like the early season completely untouchable Cano, but he was a really good version of himself in the month of August. And the O's needed that and are gonna need it with Felix presumably done for this year. Rookie of the month for August, it was tough to not give it to Gunnar Henderson, who was great again, but I gotta give it to Grayson Rodriguez. I mean, almost as good as Kyle Bradish was in August. Five August starts for Rodriguez in 30 and two-thirds innings. He had a 2.64 ERA with a 23% K rate, just a 7% walk rate, and a 57% ground ball rate. That was not the case when Grayson was struggling the first time he was up in the bigs, giving up a lot of fly balls and giving up a lot of homers. He's kept the ball on the ground. He's gotten the strikeouts. He's been great, and he's been a huge boost for the rotation. Biggest surprise player in the month, got to give it to James McCann, who had a couple of rough games right at the end of August, but overall, 44 plate appearances in the month for McCann, a month that kind of started with him dominating his old team in the New York Mets. He hit 359 in August with a 409 on base and a 538 slugging, good for a 161 WRC+, plus by far McCann's best offensive month of the season, also throughout multiple, multiple base runners, had a great month behind the dish as a catcher. Just showed himself to be a really valuable backup to Adley Rutschman in this last month. Biggest disappointment, there were a couple players I was considering. Almost gave it to Kyle Gibson. Almost gave it to Cedric Mullins. But I'm going to give it to Jack Flaherty. Because I don't think we all expected Jack Flaherty to come in like be the ace of this O's staff after they traded for him. But they got him. You know, They gave up something to get Jack Flaherty. He has a really strong six innings, one run, eight strikeout start in Toronto to start his O's tenure. And it just has not been good since then. Flaherty in the four starts in an Oriole uniform has a 6.41 ERA in 19 and two-thirds innings pitched and walking too many guys, getting hit too hard. You know, he had the, the issue with the soreness and the missing the time and just kind of a weird situation there. It's been disappointing. Hopefully he can bounce back and pull it together in September. He's a guy who's done it in September, done it in the playoffs. Hopefully that can continue. And then I want to give out the best win of the month. I think you all know what it was. August 12th in Seattle, the Orioles win it 5-3 to three in 10 innings to win the series, take two out of three from the Red Hot Mariners. It was the Cedric Mullins game. He robs the homer in the ninth inning to keep the Orioles in the lead, only for Mike Bauman to give up a homer to the very next batter that sends it to extras. But it didn't matter. Cedric Mullins was there. He hits a two-run homer in the top of the 10th to give the O's the lead. They would win the game and win the series. Mullins hit 180 in August otherwise, and I was tempted to give him most disappointing because he was not very productive for the Orioles this month, but the fact that he just took a game over and won a huge game in Seattle by himself, I couldn't give him most disappointing and had to shout him out for the best win of the month. Those are the Orioles August awards. Let me know in the comments here on YouTube. Make sure to like, comment, and subscribe to the Locked on Orioles YouTube page, and let me know in the comments, hey, which awards would you give out? Who would you give out differently to some of those awards in August, one of the O's best months of the season? But we got a little bit more to get to here on the pod before we finish up. Orioles after the off day Thursday back in action here on Friday night. Get ready to stay up late once again. A little more West Coast baseball, Orioles and Diamondbacks coming up this weekend. I will preview the series after this. So it's the Orioles and the D-backs in Arizona this weekend as the O's set out for a little nine-game road trip starting in the desert. This Diamondbacks team, kind of interesting, right? Like for the first half of the season, people were talking about the Orioles and the Diamondbacks kind of in the same breath, right? They were both playing well. Both teams were at or near first place in their divisions. Well, since then, the Orioles have continued to skyrocket. They're in first. They're 83 and 50. The D-backs have faltered. They at one point fell under 500. Right now, they're 69 and 65. They, as I speak at the moment, and this will change once the Padres and the Giants play on Thursday night, but at the moment, they are outside of the playoff picture. They are a half game back of the Giants for the final wildcard spot in the National League, and they just got swept on the road in LA against the Dodgers, something that continues to happen to the Arizona Diamondbacks. But what will this series look like this weekend? So first of all, taking a look at this D-backs team. Again, they were playing good baseball. They had won like seven of eight before they got swept by the Dodgers, but it's been a really up and down recent part of the season for Arizona. They are just fighting everything they can for a wild card spot. Now, the way this team is built, it's pretty solid starting pitching. It's a good lineup, and it's a really bad bullpen. 
that's what the Diamondbacks look like. Who's hot right now in the lineup? The former Oriole Christian Walker had a 140 WRC plus in August. He's hitting homers again, playing a great defensive first base. Lourdes Gurriel, who the Orioles know well, was traded over to the D-backs this offseason. He's been hitting it well in August. And Corbin Carroll, who seems to be the kind of front runner for the NL Rookie of the Year award. It was fun to be fun to see him and Gunnar Henderson on the same field this weekend. He's had a 121 WRC plus in August, continues to play well. But this D-backs bullpen is not good. They added to it somewhat at the deadline. They traded with the Mariners for the Mariners closer, Paul Seawald. Since then, the Mariners have gotten better. The D-backs have arguably gotten worse. Seawald's been okay at the end of games, but this bullpen has been a disaster. The D-backs bullpen had a 5.61 ERA in the month of August, and their 4.69 bullpen ERA for the season is 25th in baseball. They needed to address it more than Seawald at the deadline, and they did not. An old friend, Miguel Castro, is in that bullpen, so we may get to see him pitch against the O's this weekend, which will be fun. But for the Orioles this weekend, which... It's kind of been for the last few series, right? Like with this Colorado series, with the White Sox series, just get into that bullpen. Even if you're down late, as long as you keep the game close, you're going to have a chance to come back and win against this Diamondbacks team. And let's take a look at the pitching matchups this weekend, starting with a Friday night game here tonight, September 1st, a 9.40 p.m. Eastern time start. So a take a nap during the day today. Cole Irvin will get the start for the Orioles in this one. The left-hander coming off a start that... Wasn't as good as he had been lately. Six innings, four earned runs against the Rockies his last time out. He'll go up against the former Orioles prospect, Zach Davies, who never pitched in an Orioles uniform, was traded over to Arizona for Gerardo Parra at the 2015 deadline, if you remember that one. Yeah, what a time to be alive right there. Um, But Zach Davies, now 30 years old, has not been good this year. Not really sure why the Diamondbacks are still giving him starts, but they are. 6.93 6.93 ERA in 62 and a third innings this year for Davies. He was okay in his last start. Five innings of one run ball against the Reds. That was when he returned. His last start before that, before he went out for a while, was back in July when he gave up nine runs to the Atlanta Braves. Orioles hoping to kind of get to Davies here as he returns to this team, just his second start back. Then we go to Saturday, a little earlier start, a little easier to watch this one, just an 8, 10 p.m. Eastern time start on Saturday. And Kyle Bradish just gave him the Orioles Cy Young for August. Could he win the actual Cy Young? I mean, a 303 ERA in 24 starts this season. Coming off another good one against Colorado, six innings, two runs, eight strikeouts, and one walk. Bradish will go against an interesting right-hander. Slade Ciccone is the starter for Arizona on Saturday night. 24-year-old righty who the Diamondbacks took with the 33rd overall pick out of Miami in the 2020 draft. So came up this year. He has made five starts in 21 innings. He has a 2.57 ERA. Now he's not striking out a lot of guys, just 14 Ks in those 21 innings, but he hasn't walked a lot of guys either. Zero walks in his last two starts covering 10 and two thirds innings. And his last one against Cincinnati, five and two thirds, one run, three hits, five Ks, no walks. He's been looking a lot better recently for the D-backs. And then this series will finish off on Sunday with a 4.10 p.m. Eastern time start. Jack Flaherty is back to the hill for the Orioles. Finally returned to the rotation after skipping multiple starts. He went five and two-thirds, seven hits, three runs, three Ks, and one walk against the Rockies on Sunday. He'll go up against the D-backs Cy Young candidate. That is Zach Gallen, the 28-year-old righty who has been outstanding over the past few years for Arizona. 28 starts. He's got a 3-3-2 ERA at 173 innings this season. But Gallon coming off of one of his worst starts of the year. Now, granted, it was against the Dodgers, but he allowed six runs on nine hits over five and a third innings. He's usually much better than that. We'll see what the O's can do against Gallon on Sunday. And you can listen to every single pitch of the Orioles hometown radio broadcast of all three games this weekend in Arizona with the SXM app through Sirius XM. Just download the app and search Orioles. And then I'll be back on Monday recapping the entire series between the Orioles and the Diamondbacks as the O's just trying to right now hold on to first place. They got a game and a half lead over the Rays. Hopefully they are still in that number one spot. Rays are taking on the Guardians this weekend who claimed a lot of those players that ended up on waivers. It turns out the Orioles did put it a claim on multiple players. I had heard that Matt Moore was one of the players the Orioles made a claim on. Unfortunately, all those guys that the Angels and other teams waived really never got to the Orioles. 
Well, the Guardians got a lot of them. They got Giolito. They got Ronaldo Lopez. Hopefully those guys can help them beat the Rays this weekend. And hopefully the O's can take care of business against the Diamondbacks. But either way, I'll be back to recap it on Monday. Until then, I'm Connor Newcomb, and this has been the Locked On Orioles podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day.